Welcome to the Perry World House 2022 Global Shifts Colloquium, Islands on the, on the Climate Frontline, Risk and Resilience. We are so pleased to see you at this keynote event, Oceans at Risk with Fabian Cousteau, moderated by Lisa Friedman of the Climate Desk of the New York Times. Covering 70% of the world's surface, oceans are the world's largest ecosystem. They provide oxygen for every second breath we take, assure food security and livelihoods for billions, and service the Earth's biggest carbon sink. But the world's seas are under siege, under serious threat by global warming, overconsumption, and pollution, among other problems. This event will discuss how we can preserve this lifeline for humanity and how you can be a part of that solution. Following in his family's footsteps, Fabien Cousteau has worked tirelessly to protect our planet's immense and endangered marine habitats. From his vast experience in the field, coupled with a degree in environmental economics from BU, he has refined a public policy platform grounded by his strong belief that environmental discipline can be the basis for innovative solutions that strike a balance between regional and global environmental problems and the realities of market economies. In spring of 2014, Fabian embarked on Mission 31. He and his team of scientists and filmmakers lived aboard Aquarius Reef Base for 31 days testing new technologies and conducting research on the effects of climate change on corals, sponges, and other sea life. Cousteau's Mission 31 surpassed his grandfather's famous 30-day stay aboard the Continental Ice Shelf Station 2 in 1963. In conjunction with his father and sister, Fabian has also been the star of PBS's acclaimed series, Ocean Adventures, which brings the beauty of the oceans directly into viewers' homes. He has also appeared frequently on the Oprah Winfrey Show and the Today Show. Lisa Friedman is a reporter on the Climate Desk at the New York Times, focusing on climate and environmental policy in Washington. She has covered eight international climate talks and chased climate-related stories from the bottom of a Chinese coal mine to the top of snow-capped Himalayan mountains. She previously worked for Climate Wire, where she led a team of 12 reporters focused on the business and politics of the changing climate. Before Climate Wire, she was the Washington Bureau Chief for the Oakland Tribune and later the Los Angeles Daily News. So you are um, in store for an amazingly deep discussion with two experts. So please join me in welcoming Fabian and Lisa to Perry Royal House on the stage. I hope this is okay. I'm triply vax, I feel like a, uh, a pin cushion and experiment, but here we are, all in one room, thankfully. Aren't we lucky? Aren't we lucky to be invited to live on the only little oasis in space that we know of that contains virtually all the life that we cherish, that we take advantage of, that we depend on, this little blue oasis in space. Now, as you may have heard, let's see if the clicker works here, and it does not. Can the magician behind the curtain help me with that to the next slide? Okay, maybe not. Anyway, so my name is Fabien Cousteau. Um, as some, oh, yes, there we go. That's me on a better day. <laughs> getting wet, getting, having fun. Um, I'm a third generation ocean explorer. Uh, and I've had the unbelievable privilege to be able to experience some of the farthest remote regions of the world. And as such, the lessons of life were probably just as valuable as the lessons I learned in school. As a matter of fact, um, I was a terrible student. I shouldn't be saying this at UPenn, should I? Uh, I? And as much as my professors and teachers were amazing people, I was always dreaming about the next adventure. And as such, the people who were part of the team, part of the family, if you will, uh, on expeditions, whether they be in the Red Sea, up the Amazon, New Guinea, Antarctica, et cetera, were really the teachers. These were pioneers. These are people who were at the forefront of the expertise that we've learned to extract to start learning about 
the vast majority of our planet. Our planet, we always think about the brown and green veneer. And we're right here on the cusp of Earth Day. And I think to myself, we celebrate Earth Day every year for over five decades. And what have we learned? Well, we're starting to learn our integral connection with this ocean world. But we don't think about ocean when we talk about Earth Day. That's a real problem. Because, let me see if it clicks now. Yes, there we go. Because at the end of the day, the ocean is the vast majority of our planet. It's the circulatory system of all life that we are connected to. It is, in essence, our serial connector. And it is the vast majority of our living space. When we go through lower school, we're taught that the water, our planet, is 72% of our world. That's not true. Simply not true. Why do I, uh, do I challenge that? Because we're looking at our planet in a two-dimensional space. Ocean is 99% of our world's living space, within which some 90 plus percent of our biodiversity lives and thrives. It is the reason why we exist. It is the reason why every other breath that you've taken in your lifetime has happened. It's thanks to our ocean world. And I've had the privilege of being able to found a few companies, as you saw in the previous slide. One of them is a nonprofit. Because as an ocean explorer and documentary filmmaker, we tell stories, right? Ideally, it goes back to something my grandfather used to say, which is, if one person has the chance to lead an extraordinary life, he or she has no right to keep it to themselves. Well, it's all fine and great to be able to share those experiences, that campfire story, but we need to be able to engage people around the world to become part of the solution. Because once you talk about the bad news, talk about the exciting news, how is it that we can have us as a species become that next step in the evolutionary process so that we can live in more in symbiotic relationship? with our ocean. So the nonprofit uh, that I created, the Fabian Cousteau Ocean Learning Center, aims to do just that in a way that caters, in essence, to minds like myself, that ADD kid that is overstimulated, that uh, pays attention more to things like this than they should, <laughs> and really gets connected with a part of our world that we're so distant to, we're so disconnected with. And yet, the more we learn nowadays, the more we realize how integrally inter, how do you say it in English? Integrally connected. You can correct me on that. Uh, <laughs> uh, with that life support system, we've explored less than five percent of our ocean world to date. If you think about volume, that's three point four billion cubic kilometers of volume waiting to be discovered. So maybe slightly sarcastically, I say, bring on climate change. That just brings about more area for me to explore. But the reality is not such. As a species, we depend on that little veneer that we live on as terrestrial creatures, but we also just as much depend on the health of our aquatic ecosystem. Uh, let's see if this still works. Yes. So let me share with you a brief video of the latest endeavor something called Project Proteus. And I might have to ask the wizard behind the curtain to actually push the video button. Nope, wrong button. Back, yes, yes, play, yes, thank you. Says quick time not available. Well, too bad. I guess you're not going to get to see this. But let me explain to you. A few years ago, I had a chance to lead um, a team of intrepid, young, aspiring PhD students on a mission called Mission 31. Mission 31 is a mission that we spent 31 days underwater at the last remaining undersea marine laboratory called Aquarius. It's a glorious 400 internal square feet 
So about the size of a school bus where we spent 31 days at 20 meters in saturation. But the idea wasn't to stay inside this nice cozy little habitat. The idea was to leverage what it gives us, the unprecedented access to the bottom world. Because we were in saturation, we became aquanauts. And as aquanauts, we were able to venture forth indefinitely outside in that Pandora's box of mysteries, the undersea coral reef. And as we progressed, we saw that the world in front of us unfolded and accepted us as part of them after a few days. And we saw things, we studied things, we brought back data, enough so in 31 days that we were able to generate over 12 research papers spanning from climate change related issues to predator prey behavior to the uh, degradation of uh, predators on coral reefs and how that affects the, uh, the dynamics of the coral reef. And probably one of the most special parts of it was that we were able to connect with 100,000 students live from the bottom of the sea in all seven continents. Yes, Antarctica as well. And that interaction to be able to show people that will never get a chance to see the ocean world, at least not in this way, in a personal way, why the boom of the Goliath grouper, which is hotter than the surface of the sun for a split second, is so important. Why the technology that we were developing or helping test at this extreme environment is so important for space exploration. Oh, I enjoy that music. <laughs> the point of that is that it gave a catalyst to realizing that we're missing a very valuable tool in the toolbox of ocean exploration. Why is it that we spend over 200 billions in space tourism today when we spend one one hundredth of that in the United States in ocean exploration in our life support system so that we can learn more about climate change, about the uh, overconsumption of natural resources, and of course, of all the pollution issues that we're having in our circulatory system of life. So with that, I present to you, at least not visually, but in theory, Proteus. Proteus will be the International Space Station of the Sea. And I'm proud to say that we're basing it on an island nation of Curacao or in the island nation of Curacao, more specifically in the, the ocean world. And it will be 10 times the size of Aquarius, capable of housing three times as many people for indefinite periods of time with all the fun toys that science can bring in a research lab, some of the most advanced research labs on the planet, right there at our fingertips at the bottom of the sea so that we can learn more in real time about what's happening to the ocean world. So we can make better decisions create innovative approaches and implement those approaches in pragmatic ways on land. But I, I digress and I go too far. And that's really the interplay between ocean exploration and all the things that we're concerned with today. A lot of these are, are listed up above, including the SDGs or Sustainable Development Goals. But I go too far and I don't wanna take away from the thunder of the Q&A because that's my favorite part. But at the end of the day, the fundamental aspect of this is that we must understand that as much as I love space exploration, sign me up if there's a two-way ticket to Mars, the reality is that in our lifetimes and in our children's lifetimes, there will be no better, more beautiful planet than our little blue orb in space. Ask any astronaut what they stare at most of the time when they're in the ISS. It's the planet, it's Earth, because it is such an amazing place, it's our home. And with that said, maybe I'll stop right there and say one thing that my grandfather taught me, which is the most valuable thing that I ever got. It's summarized like this. People protect what they love, they love what they understand, and they understand what they're taught. So with that, I yield the floor to Lisa, my hero. <laughs> that is a click up, right? Oh, do we? Yeah, it's a good background. <laughs>
Fabian, thank, thank you. you. It is really an honor. Thank you, to... Wizard, for clicking for me. I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> Most of it worked. It's it's really an honor to speak to you. You're a champion of the ocean, and I, I can't think of anyone better to have a discussion about the ocean's challenges and its its miracles. Um, I want to dig into Proteus, but <laughs> first, you know, I you learned to scuba dive at four. You've been you started going on research expeditions with your grandfather at seven. Is, it, is that right? Tell us a little bit first, you know, on a personal level about what what the ocean means to you, what some of your fondest memories are. Well, that's a softball if I ever heard one. But I want it. <laughs> <laughs> Lisa is one of my heroes. Uh, she dives deep into climate change related issues. And I'm just honored to be up here on stage with you and in front of uh, our esteemed uh, group here um, and the ones online as well. Uh, I don't recommend throwing someone in the ocean at four years old to go scuba diving. <laughs> but that said, I'm a curious creature. Uh, and as such, I remember when I was four, this was my fourth birthday, actually, uh, I saw one of our family friends, and we have an unusual circle of friends. Uh, I saw one of my family friends at the bottom of our pool reading a newspaper. And that thought, I found that curious. So I went down to go see what he was doing. And he put something in my mouth that allowed me to breathe. And that was a regulator. And I realized that while we were buddy breathing underwater, how amazing it was to be able to fly free, broken from the earthly bonds of gravity. And that really got my, my you know, young mind just scintillating. A few weeks later, we went to uh, the um, Catalina Island off of the coast of California. And that was my first open water scuba dive. And I, the aha moment was probably at that moment I, I was hooked. I became addicted to ocean because we were flying through these beautiful 30 foot tall kelp forests and the Garibaldi, which are bright orange, were spotting all around this kind of green undulating background and the shafts of light were coming down through that. And it felt like you were in one of the most beautiful cathedrals on the planet. And that always stuck with me. Beyond that, uh, I started going on expeditions when I was about seven because that was one of the best places for our family to get together. Back in the early days, uh, there was no such thing as cell phones and such, and, and communications were really hard to get. So my grandparents and my parents being on expeditions uh, all over the world, uh, the Calypso went around the world for uh, 12 times over that 50 year span. Uh, it was the best place to get together as a family. And that was an unbelievable privilege. Now, beyond this, uh, they, I, I became um, a crew member at 12 years old um, on, when I wasn't going to school and not paying attention. And I, you know, unless, unless I paint too much nice of a picture, uh, the family was a big believer in community and being able to work together, each one having a task, but being able to help the other person. And so I would start by scrubbing the barnacles off. The, I knew how to scuba dive. So first thing I did, summer break, scrub the barnacles off the hull, <laughs> clip so for the summer. Then after that, it became you know, taking the, the, the rust off the engine parts and so on and so forth. But eventually I got a chance to become one of the divers uh, on the, uh, the expeditions. And that's really where the passion and, and conduit uh, went into a direction that I'd never really imagined. Uh, we we're never encouraged to become uh, part of the family business, so to speak, but it's a, a, it was a, a natural love for our aquatic wonder world. That's amazing. So I, I hear all the time that we know so little about the ocean. What, what do we not know? And, and what can research efforts like what Proteus is doing teach us? Ultimately. What do we not know? We think we know everything. Um, and consistently, every time we go out there and take the next fin step in ocean exploration, we realize how little we know. 
uh, we've explored to any real extent about 5%, 7% of our ocean. Uh, we're, we as a, a, a global community of ocean researchers and, and, and um, adventurers are looking at mapping about 30% of the ocean by 2030. Uh, we're, we're getting close to that goal. It would be nicer if we could actually protect 30% uh, of our ocean by 2030, uh, which is a uh, UN goal. The, the reality is even if you, if you map the ocean floor, it, and that's a wonderful thing, it doesn't mean that we've explored it because at the end of the day, we, it's, it's like looking at a, uh, a traditional paper map and saying, I wanna go there. Uh, that's about as good as it gets. Um, and although we go from a, a mile resolution from satellite to now looking at uh, um, maybe several meters of resolution on some of the uh, multi-beam sonars that we're, we're mapping the ocean floor with, uh, we still have a lot to go. Look at what's happening in the biochem world. Uh, most research in history has been done on surface related uh, subjects and organisms. In uh, this year, we have 17 drugs that are derived from marine compounds uh, that are FDA approved, another 31, I think, that are in the process of. Everything from uh, leukemia uh, to uh, treatments to uh, pain mitigators and so on. For example, Prealt is a uh, pain mitigator derived from a cone snail venom, most venomous animal on the planet. And that chemical composition has been replicated to combat uh, chronic pain in extreme, uh, extreme cases. For example, uh, that, that uh, drug is used in hospitals thousand times more powerful than morphine without the opioid side effects. And that's just scratching the surface. This is literally Pandora's box of discoveries waiting to happen. Uh, you know, deep water sponges and corals and such are, are, are giving us a glimpse as to the possibilities between uh, cancer and, and um, other problems. So that's just one aspect, one, one small sliver of the kind of research that's out there. But imagine, we're, we're always focusing on the macrocosmic, right? The whales, the dolphins, the sharks. They're all pretty awesome creatures. But what about the microcosmic? We know nothing about that. So I'm really excited. And beyond diving, traditional diving depth, it, it's a complete mystery. You know, I mean, I, I have other questions about the project and I was gonna wait a beat to dive into climate change, but I'm, I'm gonna shift because I'm curious how, <laughs> how climate change is affecting your, not just the ocean, but also your ability to study the ocean and-, and So uh, climate change affects virtually everything on the planet. Uh, the ocean is a great barometer for climate change related issues. Uh, it, it's also a mitigator because it's actually, because of its density, because of its chemical properties and so on and so forth, it's actually slowed the effects of climate change. Um, but it also is just like anything, anyone who's boiled water before understands, uh, it, it's also accumulating a vast amount of energy ready to be released, right? In all sorts of, very form, of various forms that we do not want including losing island nations and such. In the, the micro world uh, underwater, uh, it's devastating coral reefs, right? About 65% of the world's coral reefs today uh, are dead or dying. Uh, by the end of the century, 99% uh, if we continue on this path. Uh, I know you and I were talking about the, the 1.5 degrees C uh, changes. Uh, it, it's, it's, that's just the tip of the iceberg, no pun intended. How have you seen the ocean change in your lifetime? There are so many changes that have happened. I can't bring my 10 year old daughter to places I was when I was her age because it's a ghost town, it's a wasteland. Okay. Uh, there are still places that are beautiful. I don't wanna depress everyone thoroughly, although I can do that if you really want me to. Um, the Florida Keys, and, and, and I don't mean to be picking on them specifically because there are a lot of places out there like that, the Mediterranean, the same thing, are devoid of life compared to what it was when I was a teenager, uh, even in my 20s. My grandfather was talking about climate change in the 1960s. Look at uh, the PBS series he did uh, 
in the 1970s called uh, Oasis in Space. It's hugely depressing, but the stuff we're talking about today, uh, it's shocking to us that despite all the warning signs for many, many decades, how little progress has been made and how amazing we, how many abilities we have to change things if we wanted to. We have the technology, we have the know-how, we need to have the understanding, the love, the drive that this affects our future. And I wanna just pause for a moment and tell the audience, if you see me looking at my cell phone, I'm not secretly texting my husband on stage. <laughs> Lauren and the folks at Perry World House are sending me questions that are coming in online. And we'll take questions soon from the audience and we encourage you to, to, to line up when we, when we do. Um, you know, we just heard from a number of ambassadors and leaders of small island countries about what keeping global temperature rise to 1.5 means to them and their livelihoods and their countries and their existence. Um, can you describe a little bit the difference in a degree a half a degree, you know, what, what, is, what is the difference between 1.5 degrees and two degrees for the ocean? For us as human beings, it means the loss of coastlines, it means the loss of island nations that are low lying. It means, uh, we were talking about this earlier, uh, two thirds of Florida being underwater, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The New York City having problems, so on and so forth. Um, I mean, I hate to say this and, and, and our representatives in government are extraordinarily important. We elect them, but they're there for short term. So they have to make short term decisions. A lot of the things that we face are long term decisions. And I know human beings hate long term decisions, but we, we must commit because at the end of the day, this is, and I say this all the time, this isn't a cost. We have to get this out of our minds. This is an investment in our future. At the end of the day, the planet doesn't care. You know, and we, we wipe out the planet, wipe out, we'll, the planet will regenerate after we're gone. It's our decision whether we want to be here and how we want to be here. More specifically, how our children uh, are going to grow up. Are we going to give back to them what we've taken for granted? Or are we just going to uh, continue to downward spiral into a, a, a miserable existence? Um, I believe in the human being. And I believe that we can make a lot of differences, but it's, it's not relegated to ambassadors or government officials. It's all of us. And we're gonna have some, some really interesting decisions to make. And it's, they're not all gonna be difficult. They just have to be outside the box. I don't believe in the word impossible. That's an excuse for adults not to do something. And I, I do believe that the individual is responsible for helping make those decisions. It's not on somebody else, like a government official. You know, um, it's, it's about businesses, it's about CEOs having kids too, it's about government officials helping the process, helping facilitate the process, but it's about the general public being part of the solution. And, and those, th those solutions are, are abound. I'm not gonna bore you with, with examples, but um, we can do things that are very simple at home. Actually, bore us with examples. Give us a practical <laughs> something, okay. you know, because I think there's a, there's a healthy debate to be had and that has been, happening right over, over the, the, the tension between personal responsibility and whether uh, addressing climate change is fundamentally something that requires a systemic change, a carbon tax or something, you know. So, so as individuals, what would you say is, is one of the most important things that we could do for ocean health? Well, uh, for, for planetary health, I mean, the ocean is a circulatory system that connects us all, right? It's, it's what we depend on for virtually everything. And, but, but it has to do with land as well. Um, at the end of the day, we have to change our mindset, change our language. That's where it starts. And that doesn't cost anything. It just, it just costs us consciousness. There is no such thing as a way. This is a closed loop system. This little ball is a closed loop system. Island nations are closed loop systems. Throwing something away is a fallacy. And now we're throwing things away that last 500 years. And I even said it just now. <laughs> and now we're throwing things into our environment that, that last 500 to 1,000 years. And a lot of these, these pieces of garbage that we call garbage 
our uh, vehicles for endocrine disruptors, for example, fossil fuel type of, of products like plastic. That affects our health. So what's happening to our planet is happening to us. I had tea this morning. How many of you drink tea? One, two, three. So a fair number of you. Anyone who uses a tea bag, that is an off-the-shelf synthetic tea bag, when you put it in there, that one cup of tea now has over 2 million pieces of plastic in that one cup of tea that you readily drink down and it becomes part of you. On average, we have about a credit card size with a plastic in our bodies. That's, that should be a wake-up call. But we can change our, our mindset. The second one is that the word impossible is not something we can afford to use as far as our decisions today. Uh, and by and large, when we implement innovative approaches and solutions, it breeds new jobs, it breeds better uh, economics and so on and so forth. It's just that the few that benefit from the traditional systems have a tendency to resist change. Let's look at how nature works the three basic laws of nature for longevity, adaptation, evolution, and diversification. And those are things that we need to implement in our everyday lives, just like we do in business decisions. So a behavioral change that you would recommend? 100%. Look no, at, that, look at, what, I'm asking, what, what is a behavioral change? Well, let me that... look at, at the United States. I, and again, I'm, <laughs> I'm a resident of the United States. I don't want to pick specifically on the US, but they happen to be a leader in so many things but we're also a leader in pollution. You have 5% of the world's population consuming 20% of the world's resources and counting, and then not doing anything, well, doing comparatively little about it per capita. So there's a lot of opportunity there. And again, I don't, you know, whenever, I, I'm a big proponent of not blaming people because when you're pointing your finger at someone, there's three fingers pointing back at you. <laughs> so, you know, at the end of the day, we're on the proverbial same boat. So behavioral change is, is definitely one. Um, there are a lot of concessions uh, and, and, and mitigations that aren't clear, meaning they're not, they're not perfect solutions, but anything is better than where we are today. So I'd, I'd love to ask folks to start lining up for questions if you have, I'll, I'll start going through some that we have here. Um, you know, there's been, there's a lot of questions coming in about why you think the ocean is so unexplored given its importance to human existence. Is it just oh, so that's, difficult? Yeah, that's an easy one. Um, why, uh, well, it's an easy one. It's, it's an easy and a hard one. I, we, we have difficulties sometimes answering this. Uh, the simple, simple version is it's an extreme environment. And it's varied, you know, the deeper you go, the more pressure, the, the more pressure, the more difficult it is technologically to get there. Obviously, our human physiology, uh, physiology has limits because we have air cavities in our bodies, uh, which are uh, um, barriers or at least challenges that we need to, to mitigate. Um, so yes, we can send robots and things like that to the bottom of the ocean, but that, that only gives us a, a sliver of more information. Uh, so that's one aspect. Uh, two, a lack of understanding, not necessarily by an educated uh, community, but by the community at large. It's astounding to me. I'll give you a very trite example. We did a, a documentary on the National Marine Protected Areas of the United States. Went to the Florida Keys, and we're doing a, a you know man in the street interviews. Shockingly. No one knew that Aquarius existed there. Nine miles offshore, it's one of their crown jewels in Florida. We would ask the average person on the street, did you know you had, um, oh, and by the way, the Aquarius is situated in a marine protected area called Penny Camp State Park. And we'd say, did you know you had a, a marine protected area here? And they go, oh, we didn't know Marines had a protected area here. <laughs> and so that, that's where the discussion needs to start. Right, I mean, it, it certainly recalibrates your perspective of what the average person understands and doesn't about the ocean. And that's okay, but we have a lot to get to in a short amount of time with the community at large. And so, um, you know, a lot of the planets, uh, a lot of the, the OLC's programming is based on those sorts of things, but we're just one tiny little entity. Um, at the end of the day, it's, it's about all of us participating in that conscious uh, shifting. And so, 
as an as a, a as an ocean educated person, or at least a cure ocean curious person, it's incumbent upon us to propagate that information and to encourage others to understand why oceans are so important to the decisions we make in all sorts of things like climate change. Gentlemen over here. Okay, hi. You can tell uh, us your name. Sure, I'm Simon Richter, um, old enough to have watched your grandfather uh, during the 60s. Um, I wanted to ask a question about deep sea mining. Uh, okay. That's an area we don't know a lot about, but people or companies are very excited about. Um, what advice would you give governments, small island states, um, companies, UN bodies about um, going ahead with deep sea mining, how to do it, whether to do it? Uh, I was hoping that question wouldn't pop up. <laughs> <laughs> it's an excellent question. Uh, we, I, I've had the, the privilege of being able to work with the UN uh, on some levels, uh, and that topic comes up quite a bit. Okay. Uh, I would say to governments, look what's happened on land with regard to mining. And by and large, that's a, that's a two-dimensional problem. Right, so mitigating the impact that it has on everything else is dictated by gravity, amongst other things. The ocean, by and large, is, is the Wild West. Um, everyone loves to benefit from ocean resources. No one wants to take responsibility for protecting ocean resources and protecting uh, and 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 governing the way we treat our natural resource bank account. And this is why we are where we are. We lost 65% of our world's wild fish stocks, uh, climate change related issues, pollution, you know, plastics and so on and so forth. With regard to ocean mining, I think it's a really bad idea right now. First of all, the mining companies or the, the, the prospective mining companies will tell you that the resources are endless. And my question is, how do you know? Number two, how do we know what you're doing at the bottom of the sea, 12,000 feet down? There's no one there to monitor. There's no independent monitoring system. So at the end of the day, you can do whatever you want and we wouldn't know. Um, I don't mean to be cynical, but when people can get away with things, they oftentimes do. Uh, the abuses, uh, uh, the examples of abuses are infinite. Uh, we can point to all various things. So until we understand what the impact is and what the technology is in terms of ocean bed mining, we really should be extraordinarily cautious about making decisions on this. Because at the end of the day, what you do to the bottom of the sea lasts forever as far as our species is concerned. Um, you see that with you know, clear cutting of the oceans with the, with the drag, uh, the, the, the persaining and, and, and uh, the, the big ocean draggers. The, that was not English, that was French, sorry. Um, the, the idea that we need more of those materials is understandable because of the consumption rate. Uh, what I would say is the real mines, the real gold mines, if you will, or at least uh, minerals and such, are, are giant garbage pits all around the world. It's amazing to me how much we throw away. It's amazing to me how much we just accumulate in things that will eventually be extraordinarily valuable if they're, if they're not already seen as valuable. The highest parts of Florida are unfortunately, the dumps. And I postulate that if you were to go digging in there, you can get all the minerals and, and heavy and, and metals and things like that that you need uh, before going into the ocean and doing these things with great abandon. So uh, I'm, I'm not for it right now. Uh, we just, we don't have the procedure in place and uh, the potential for complete environmental disasters is, is pretty high. Go to an online question and then over here. Uh, 
This is really interesting. It, it, going back to biomedical research, if drugs and novel treatments are found in the open ocean, who owns them? <laughs> well, it should be a public good, right? <laughs> That's an excellent question. So um, I would imagine the the chemical, it, it, so the, the raw, uh, the, the samples, <laughs> depending on where they are, and I say samples in, in a generic way, um, I guess belong to the ocean, but the, the way you analyze and, and replicate and so on and so forth belongs to the company, um, I would guess. If you were to take Proteus as a, as a platform for research in pharma, let's say we have a tenant model, which we do, uh, on on uh, Proteus. Proteus is not meant for me. It's meant for uh, as the, the United Nations of research platforms. So um, within context, uh, it's a civilian platform. So no weapons of war, none of that stuff. But let's say we want to cure the next uh, viral pandemic. Actually, uh, viral researchers are extremely interested in this because viruses underwater, it's one of the most uh, uh, abundant uh, organisms, right? But virals, uh, viral organisms underwater, uh, the DNA changes when you bring them out of the water. And so you lose all that data. So being able to study these things underwater is extraordinarily important. So imagine if you can find a, a cure, not in, in years to something, but in months. Um, that could be a, a, an extremely good conduit for that. But that, of course, being a tenant model, uh, would belong to the research company, the biochem company, or what have you, or the, the, the research institution from a university. Uh, there could be a profit share, there could be, you know, whatever you want, uh, or, or IP share, sorry, not profit share, but an IP share, but it's a complicated question. Who funds Proteus? So Proteus is right now as a social good enterprise. Uh, the uh, Proteus Ocean Group is the manager of Proteus. Uh, I'm sorry, let me, let me put more, uh, <laughs> more definition on that. Proteus does not exist yet. We are going to be installing it right now. It looks like the schedule is by the end of 2025. So mission one, which uh, will be our mission, uh, will be 2026, uh, beginning of 2026. And then from there on, the, the doors open for uh, organiz uh, organizations like, for example, UPenn to go down and do their own research. Um, being a social good enterprise, it's a for-profit enterprise. Uh, that has investors and eventually will also have um, uh, a vehicle for uh, uh, debt remuneration. So we can actually afford to uh, give the platform or loan the platform to other entities that may not be able to pay the day rate and so on and so forth. So if you have a researcher, for example, that could use uh, Proteus, we can mitigate that through grants and partnerships that we already have to be able to fund that part of the research. And funded by what kind of investors? Right now we have private investors. Um, we have a couple of, I smile because we never even looked for them, uh, at least not in this phase. We're in phase one, uh, we'll be in phase two soon. We have sponsorships as well, uh, which we never looked for. So um, I, yeah, I'm, I'm dancing around the topic because of NDAs, <laughs> but. <laughs> Just being a good reporter, <laughs> but um, Vionic being one of them. Uh, so they're they're actually been publicly announced, so I can say that one. Uh, but we're uh, we're looking at private entities as well as scientific grants uh, to be able to fund some of this research mm -hmm. for the public for the public good. So there'll be a baseline. So there's a neural network on Proteus that's being scheduled in Proteus. It's the umbilical, if you will or the, the central nervous system uh, that has a seven senses array that will stream 24 seven data to the public, right? For public consumption, for whatever use you want. It's raw data, right? From uh, acidification. You know, I mean, there's a whole list of microplastics and so on and so forth. So that's freely available. And then there'll be the specific uses for the tenants. Gentleman over here. Thank you so much. Um, I have to say, as a as a chemist turned person that works on ocean policy, Proteus is a good name. For those that don't know, Proteus is associated with alchemy um, as well as the ocean. <clears throat> Excuse me. My real question is just: um, I was curious about other threats. So you didn't talk about IUU fishing as a kind of major threat for the ocean, and and then 
you know, you kind of hinted at you're not military, but of course there's all kinds of trafficking and other things that kind of follow the IUU fishing. So I wondered if you could, you know, just as the, as from your experience of someone that's spent a lot of time in the ocean, I'm sure you've seen many, in, many things, love to hear more about that. Yeah, um, so, you know, going back to that language thing, uh, changing our mindset. Uh, let's stop calling it seafood. Let's start calling it sea life. Because if we start giving it a value, we might actually be able to get somewhere with that question. Uh, and right now, because we don't give a value, a tangible value to the and I hate to bastardize this, but the raw material of sea life, right? You can go out there, you can catch whatever you want and bring it home, sell it, eat it, whatever. There's no line item in the economic spreadsheet of what that cost, that true cost is, right? And so that's a huge problem. And that's why we're seeing the clear cutting of the oceans. So, you know, we're down to 10% of our numbers of pelagics, meaning traveling animals. We're, uh, we're at less than 50% of our world's wild fish stocks in general. And that's a huge problem because our natural resource bank account's going bankrupt in terms of seafood, sea life. Some countries uh, are doing a great job by creating marine protected areas, truly marine protected areas, where it's just a no fishing zone off limits. I'll give you an example. The islands, uh, island nation of New Zealand um, has one of the oldest MPAs in the world. When they originally proposed the MPA, Marine Protected Area, uh, it was highly uh, aggressively petitioned not to happen because of the fishermen. Fishermen were saying, you're taking our livelihoods away. It's a very common argument. The MPA passed anyway because the public wanted it. And the Poor Knights Natural Marine Sanctuary, because of the fact that it was protected, was having such a spillover effect into the adjacent water column that the fishermen were catching twice as many fish as they ever had before. They became the biggest proponents and protectors of the MPA. They also petitioned the government to double the size of the MPA because they saw the benefit. And so it's not for me to tell anyone where to fish and what not, where not to fish. I mean, I can give my thoughts and, and ideas, but these are the kinds of people that need to talk to other fishermen around the world to show them that this is a benefit, not a cost. Uh, so this is, this, this is one aspect um, that would help with the process. And the MPAs have side benefits. For example, uh, it, it benefits tourism, quite honestly. Uh, you know, you can go snorkeling, scuba diving, et cetera, in a place that looks like a beautiful place rather than a desert wasteland. Uh, the, the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary, I'm sorry to say, is not really a sanctuary. Uh, you can still go fishing there. You can still do all sorts of things that really we, at this point in our history, we need to rethink. Um, did I answer your question? Or um, did I dance a little bit around the topic? Should we stop eating fish? No, well, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm a terrible person to, to, to follow in that world. I, I actually don't eat much. Well, first of all, why are we still hunter-gatherers in the ocean when we, were, we became farmers on land 10,000 years ago? It makes no sense. Um, so, uh, you know, closed system land-based polyculture could be an interesting um, approach to providing some of the jobs and the nutrition needed for the general community and, and the desires too, uh, providing for you know, local restaurants and, and supermarkets and such. But it's not the, the whole problem, uh, the whole answer. Mm -hmm. Part of it is also eating further down on the food web. Let's stop eating the lions and tigers of the sea. They take 35 plus years to mature and, and be able to, to, to um, reproduce. It makes absolutely no sense to eat the tuna and the billfish and so on and so forth, especially since they're also excellent vehicles at bioaccumulating all the stuff we do not want to eat. Speaking of food, I can't believe no one has asked him yet what he ate 31 days underwater, but we'll, <laughs> <laughs> we'll get to that after this question, which I'm sure is much smarter than mine, wouldn't you? <laughs> well, that's better than the one I was going to ask. Um, 
You mentioned weapons of war in the sea. Um, with the war in Ukraine, now the Russian ship that was just sunk, there most likely are nuclear weapons on that ship. So can you talk about the role of weapons of war, submarines, ships in the ocean, especially ones either nuclear powered or that have nuclear weapons on them and the damage that they, that could do? Yeah, so uh, munitions in the ocean are a huge problem. Um, there are over 3 million shipwrecks in the world over the history of human beings. Some of those, modern, especially modern day shipwrecks, from World War II on up, World War I on up, still have munitions, some of which could be live, uh, which is a, a security issue, of course. Uh, beyond that, they have a lot of toxic materials from heavy fuels and uh, explosives and things like that that are seeping into our water column. There's no better example, although tangentially so, of, Fukushima, uh, of, of this than Fukushima, right? It's still leaking. No one talks about it anymore, but it's still leaking radioactive material in, in the Pacific and will continue to do so for as long as I can see, unless somehow we can mitigate that. And what's happening is, it's, it sounds horrible, but it's over there and so on and so forth, but it's affecting all of us because at the end of the day, it seeps into the, the things we like to eat, the water we like to drink, and so on and so forth. So it, it actually does have a very tangible health uh, repercussion to all of us, regardless of where we're on this planet, especially with international trade the way it is today. So, um, you know, when, when you take uh, samples from fish in the Pacific, especially North Pacific, you can see uh, radioactive traces on many of those fish because they, they travel, they have no passports. They don't stay in, in uh, waters of, of Japan. They come across the, the, the Pacific like they always have. So we really need to understand that whatever we sink in the ocean, it's like injecting uh, toxic chemicals in our blood system. It, it travels throughout our entire system. Uh, it, it's a real, real problem. Uh, I, I don't know what the easy answer is other than cleaning up our mess. You know, and that's uh, the military is doing some of that, but a lot of it's hidden. A lot of, you know, look off uh, the coast of, of San Francisco, there's still chemical and nuclear waste dumped uh, near the Farallon Islands. No one talks about it. You'll never see it on a map, but it's there. Well, we have a few extra minutes because we started a little late. So I'm going to use it to ask the obligatory questions about spending 31 days in an underwater lab. <laughs> oh, did you want to ask about the, ask, about the food question? I do. I do. Uh, astronaut, yes. astronaut food. And then there's a gentleman over here that has a question. Um, so so um, I know you said zero, but uh, if, we, if, if everyone's got a little more patience, I'm happy to we, answer. We have five questions. more minutes. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Uh, so <laughs> being, a, uh, being the quintessential snobbish French person that I am, food and wine are very important. Um, <laughs> Uh, that was probably the hardest part of Mission 31 of living underwater in something uh, the size of a school bus is the food. The food was quite literally astronaut food. So uh, prepackaged, squeezed food, uh, freeze-dried food that you, yeah, that you reconstituted through hot water. Uh, so basically camping food for those who go camping. Uh, you know, the, our chicken breasts were these little hockey pucks that... It, it, I can go on and on. Anyway, I don't want to gross you out for lunch, but, uh, <laughs> and because we're, uh, as aquanauts, we're burning three times as many calories as we do on land, partially because of all the activities that we're doing, partially because our bodies are trying to stay warm. We have to eat three times as much of that really not good food. Um, first of all, it doesn't taste good. Secondly, it's terrible for you because of all the preservatives and salts and everything else. And you're ingesting this by the gallons full every day. So whenever there was a delivery from the surface, right? Whenever we, we once in a while, we would get visitors from the surface coming down um, to ravitailler, uh, to uh, resupply us. Uh, we would be voraciously craving things as simple as an apple. And you can't keep apples underwater because, well, first of all, it's too voluminous. And secondly, uh, as soon as you pierce that skin, it goes bad within 24 hours. And what did you do with the waste underwater? Oh, I was hoping not, you weren't not, asking. I'm, I'm sorry, I wasn't asking like the gross waste, but uh, I just meant garbage. 
I'm in. So, yeah. Uh, it, <laughs> I didn't yeah. mean to enter into it. No, no, but it's a, it, is, it is a very valid question because uh, waste management in general is an extraordinarily important question for us in general. I mean, look at island nations. You know, what do you do with waste on island nation? You know, and and you can see the repercussions of not dealing with that properly. Um, there's there's you know solid waste like plastics and things like that, packaging all that, and then there's human waste and so on. And I, I'm not going to get gross. Don't worry, but. But that is a real problem. Uh, and Aquarius being a traditional platform, they never solved that issue. Uh, with regard to space exploration, you don't have a choice but to solve that issue. So we're actually working with uh, space agencies to address that particular point. And That's five-year-olds great. love to ask that question, where do us, you know, where do equinox poop? <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, but but that's a, that's an excellent question. You know, I mean, I, I laugh, I jest, but it's it's an absolutely excellent question. And what, uh, what the only thing I can say, this is being streamed, right? <laughs> the only thing I can say is that the uh, the aquanauts preferred to go outside than inside. Uh, we had a, something called the gazebo that that was our our station of privacy. Uh, well, not so private because the fish got very excited whenever you swam out there. So that's all I'm going to say about waste management. But uh, uh, on Proteus, we have a very different system that we're incorporating into the blueprints that will uh, take care of that a little bit more uh, uh, eco-consciously. Amazing. <laughs> I don't want to uh, end on waste. So well, well, <laughs> let me want, just... Uh, well, this gentleman's been yeah, waiting patiently. Me, he might have a question... Okay, okay. And, and we'll have time. People will have time to, to accost you afterwards and, and review into conversations. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of other questions. Renewable energies. Audience. We're using. You, we're going to be using OTEC, ocean thermal energy conversion, because that island nation is conducive to that type of thing. It's a baseline energy without having to have storage, and it's uh, done properly, can power the world's needs nine times over without uh, significant environmental effects. And that I'm saying this as a general because, statement. It, there's obviously nuances to that. Right. Well, that dovetails nicely because I was going to ask you, what is the most, uh, what is something that we don't know about how the ocean can be a solution? What is what is the most important way the ocean can be not just facing these these problems, but can be a solution? Uh, the the ocean, as you can tell, we didn't prep these questions beforehand. So this these are these are big topic questions. Uh, the ocean is everything. Uh, we just haven't even thought of the ocean as anything but a recreational area, uh, an area of, of take, take, take of resources. So the, the opportunities abound uh, from uh, all sorts of alternative energy generation, which are infinitely better solutions than burning fossil fuels. I take the island. I'll go back to Curacao. I like to pick on Curacao because they're a wonderful nation. Uh, they've been very supportive and they are doing things to advance in that. Uh, they're, they're looking at, um, at, at ocean thermal. Uh, they use, of course, wind and solar as well, but that's, that has a storage medium issue. Um, in terms of fisheries, uh, they don't have any of any significance. They have a, a marine park that is a, one of their only remaining accruing reefs in the Caribbean. So that's extremely exciting. And we'll have Proteus within the MPA, or uh, within the marine park. Um, our food sources. If we look at, at, at what's happening today in, in innovative businesses, uh, people are looking at sargassum, which is considered a nuisance and a problem because of climate change related issues actually, uh, as fertilizer. So a lot of these uh, soil poor nations are now converting this into a fertilizer and becoming soil. Uh, and they, they have farming practices that they never used to have in the past. Uh, you can look at a kelp forest and things like that uh, as another form of nutrition uh, because not only can you eat dried kelp, and my daughter loves it. I can't believe how much she eats of that. Uh, the packaging is terrible, so they have to figure that out. But, but that's a great source uh, of, uh, of food, uh, and that's easily renewable if done properly. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, there's, there's a lot of solutions out there. It's just a matter of implementing them. And I hope you will give Fabian Cousteau a warm round of applause. It's been wonderful to speak with you. Thank you so much. Um, I want us to actually give a more robust applause than that. So we're going to try that again.
so we began our day and we've had, you know, we're only about uh, two thirds of the way through it with a um, scene setting, invigorating, hopeful discussion among four ambassadors from small island developing states that reminded us of our collective uh, commitment to well being and reminded us of how we're tethered to one another, hopefully for the best. I feel like this is added to the conversation in terms of letting us know that the ocean and water and marine life are vast resources worthy of our protection and that the ability to breathe and live is completely dependent upon that. And in some ways we may commercialize it, we may see it as a place for recreation, but that the well-being of oceans and waterways are absolutely essential to the continuance of, of human existence. Um, we're going to continue our um, Global Shifts Colloquium themes today, and I just have to shuffle a few papers. This is why I always love a podium, because I can't quite get all of my papers together, but um, bear with me. So we hope that for those of you who are online and those of you who are in the room, that you will then join us online later today when we have the third and final piece of our Global Shifts Colloquium. We will be meeting at four o'clock local time when we will have um, another keynote event will host Bill McKibben, author, activist, and founder of Third Act in conversation with Kathy Jetnil Killiner, a Marshallese poet, activist, and climate envoy. They will discuss the art of climate resilience and Kathy's poetry, which reflects the resilience and hope of the Marshallese in the face of sea level rise and climate change. So please join us for an all virtual event again later today at 4 p.m. And once again, we give Lisa and Fabian a, a, an enthusiastic round of applause.